Hello, this is Dr. Derek Olson. Uh, let's talk about moving into looking at the period after the New Testament. Uh, there were some basic problems that had to be overcome in the church. The first is, how do you communicate a book written in Greek to a largely iter illiterate culture, especially one that may or may not understand Greek? When we think about books in the period of the early church, these things are expensive. It took a lot of, of resources to, to create books. They're bulky. They're big. If you're carrying this as scrolls, the, the New Testament itself is, is, a, is a very large collection of scrolls. Uh, even as we move into the codex, which is the, the book form that we're used to, uh, they're still very large. They're also fragile. They don't take very well to things like rain, um, heat changes, frost, freezing, um, and can be relatively easy, easily destroyed. Um, reading them around open flames is pretty much the only way that you could do it once the sun was down. Literacy rates were low. Uh, roughly 10% of the people in the Greco-Roman world were what we would consider literate. Um, and as a result, one of the problems was how do you communicate the material in this book to a people who can't read it? So the liturgy became the central context for Christian reading and the central means of Christian reading. So the epistles and the gospels in particular were read at the Eucharist, uh, sometimes Old Testament lessons as well. Uh, and so this is where Christians could gather and hear the word read. So it doesn't matter if everyone is, if most of the people are illiterate, if you have one person, the clergy person, whether that's a bishop or a deacon or a priest, who does know how to read and can proclaim it. There were other prayer offices that also grew up in the church. The, the daily office, the prayer offices, uh, done usually seven times a day. Uh, the center of these were the Psalms, and also other scriptures were read. Um, as the monastic movement gathered steam, one of their goals was to read all of scripture every year, and this would happen in the middle of the, of the long night office. Christian preaching was a central means then by which Christians uh, could be informed about the contents of the scriptures. So while texts were read at either the Eucharist or the office, they could then be preached upon, proclaimed, explained. But this didn't always come orally. Uh, it also came visually. Christian art, as Christianity was legalized, as we began to own our own buildings, uh, we began to create art that would tell biblical stories. Uh, this is an example of one of those. This is a mosaic found at the Church of San Vitale, so mid-6th century. You can see that it, it's, it's pulling together two different biblical stories, uh, Abel and the story of Melchizedek, and it's putting them in visual relationship to the Christian Eucharist. In fact, this mosaic is, is in the apse um, right around the altar area. Uh, so a clear indication that... Uh, these two Bible stories have a very direct relationship to this sacrament that we are currently doing. Christian hymnody was also another way that Christians could memorize uh, the, the stories of Scripture. Even if they couldn't read them, uh, they could capture important pieces of that through song. Now, we have to recognize that there was a fundamental distinction between the majority of Christians and intensive Christian readers. And these people were usually clergy or monastics. So the majority of Christians could not read. But then we did have this group who focused very much on reading the scriptures. Lectio Divina is a, a Latin phrase that's used a lot uh, in the Latin church fathers to talk about the, uh, the art and the practice of sacred reading. Uh, and many people today practice something, uh, a, a discipline of reading the scriptures that goes by the name of Lectio Divina. The distinction between what many modern people do and what patristic and monastic uh, people did is that Lectio Divina means reading very slowly. And in particular, it means reading at the speed of memorization, because that's what the goal of these intensive readers was, not just to know the scriptures, but to memorize them. So the standard interpretive pattern, uh, we see this in the writings of St. Augustine, we see it in the writings of John Cashin, we see this uh, even in the writings of Origen. Um, the basic pattern is first, Christians memorize, memorizing uh, large swaths of scriptures, usually starting with the Psalms and then moving to, to the Gospels, the Epistles, and, and other parts from there. And then 
reforming your life according to the scriptures. So the first thing to do is, is not to get tangled up in complicated problems of interpretation, but instead, once you know the text, it's to live the text. It's to follow the basic instructions of the text. And only once you've done those two things do you start learning and, and applying the arts of interpretation. Uh, so the technical arts of grammar and rhetoric uh, and the philosophical tools that we talked about are important but are tertiary. First is the process of learning the scriptures through memorization. Second is actually putting them into practice. And then finally, using the more sophisticated methods and tools. Early Christian authors focused on the first two steps because, as they taught, the more that you memorize and implement, the greater your capacity for spiritual understanding becomes. The more scripture you've internalized, then the more capable you are to understand the deep meanings of God that are encoded within the scriptures. Now, all of Christian writers at this time are sharing some basic fundamental assumptions. First is that there's a single author of all of scripture, the Holy Spirit. It's responsible for the Old Testament, the New Testament, and for the other scriptural books uh, as well. The, what modern uh, Protestants refer to as the Apocrypha were simply seen as scripture. Uh, the Old and New Testaments therefore provide a continuous witness of one God in three persons. Um, there wasn't just a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. Instead, they were very much convinced that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were interwoven through both Testaments. Because all of Scripture is by a single author, it will not, at the end of the day, be contradictory. And that end of the day part is important because there are some things that we have to wrestle with. Uh, there are some scripture passages that they would say do look on the face contradictory, um, but then they need to be worked on. They need to be interpreted. More scripture needs to be brought in around them to help us understand how they're actually telling one truth about the triune God. Also, the text is intentional. Things like grammar, turn of phrase, none of these are accidental and may in fact have a significance. So as a result, you'll see a great interest in uh, the grammar used in a particular passage, for instance, uh, because if this was written by the Holy Spirit for our edification, even the smallest feature of the text might have a significant meaning. This flows into our second major assumption, and that is that all scripture contains spiritual value for us, its present readers. I, I think most modern Christians would agree that, that Scripture has a spiritual value, uh, but we tend to mean that in the broad strokes. Um, I don't know about you, but I've not heard many sermons recently on the spiritual meaning of the names of the 42 stops that the children of Israel made on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land. And, and these are the sorts of writings that you can find in this period, because the conviction is that all Scripture, even those parts, even the things that, that we think have no real spiritual benefit, uh, they were convinced that it did have something in it. Something in there pointed to a truth about God or humanity, uh, and we were better off searching for it. They also said that Scripture contains passages that are both very plain and exceedingly obscure. The obscurity of Scripture, in fact, was not considered a bug. It was considered a feature. It was an important and necessary part of Holy Scriptures. There are two reasons for this. First, because the obscurity of Scripture conceals divine truth from the unworthy. That is, Scripture is something that has to be learned and not just known, but lived into. Uh, the deepest meanings of Scripture are something that are going to be unveiled uh, not by hard thought, but by true Christian living. Uh, and as a result, some of the veiling of Scripture is because they are spiritual truths that we're simply not ready for until we have prayed and lived the Scriptures enough to understand what they're truly talking about. Second, the Scripture, they argued, gives us a greater joy and satisfaction when we work hard for its true meaning. St. Augustine, in particular, talking about this, will talk about joy and delight uh, and looking at his language, he's viewing this as a form of sacred play. Uh, that scripture interpretation is, is playing within the scriptures, uh, within the boundaries of the creeds and the community's practice, of course, but 
that that joy and delight is something that needs to be part of an authentic Christian reading of Scripture. So when we talk about reading strategies, I, I referred in the last one to Origen's breaking of Scripture into three parts, the, the body, which is the literal sense, the soul, which is the moral sense, and then the spirit and the spiritual sense. Most authors in the first several centuries are going to talk in two broad categories. They'll talk about the literal readings, and then they'll talk about spiritual or mystical reading. The literal readings, of course, are the plain sense meanings. This is what the words say on the page. Uh, and talk about the historical meanings taught by the text. Uh, so references to, to Jerusalem, according to this level of reading, uh, it's talking about the actual city. Moving over to the spiritual meaning side, a, a variety of forms of spiritual reading are broken out here. Uh, in particular, John Cashin uh, has, has a famous model that, that he borrows from Origen. One is that we begin with the spiritual or allegorical meaning. Uh, this would be where Jerusalem represents the church. Uh, then we have the anagogical, and the anagogical points to the end of things, uh, the end of human life, of, of the, the goal, purpose of human life. And so when reading it this way, we might read the word Jerusalem to refer to either heaven or the new Jerusalem, uh, what is coming uh, at the consummation of all things. Thirdly, we have the tropological. And this is the same as Origen's moral sense. Uh, and in this form of reading, Jerusalem might well refer to the soul. And so if we're talking about th what is good for Jerusalem, the joy of Jerusalem, it, it means uh, properly living the moral life. Now, these three the allegorical, the anagogical, the tropological, uh, these shouldn't be seen as part of a rigid process or as the only possible options. Instead, these are best thought of as examples of spiritual or mystical readings. Uh, they're not the only choices out there. Typology was also a very important uh, method of reading where we see things either in the Old Testament or New Testament as, as shadows of their true fulfillment uh, and they're fulfilled in Christ and in the life of the church prosopology again is is hearing the words of the scripture hearing the words of the old testament through the mouth of christ and gaining new insight into them thereby and it shouldn't these three and and others shouldn't be thought of as a rigid process it's not as if a a uh, one of the church fathers would sit down and say i'm going to give you a literal reading of this and now i'm going to explain the allegorical meaning and now i'll explain the uh the tropological meaning of this uh, that's not how it worked. Usually what you would see in, in their sermons and writings uh, is that they would speak of a literal sense, that they would then refer to mystically what this means is, uh, and not necessarily get into the nuts and bolts of, of how the interpretation is being done, uh, but simply presenting a spiritual truth that they saw this text pointing to. There's a famous scholar named uh, Beryl Smalley who wrote a very important book on the interpretation of the scriptures in the medieval period. and. One of the problems that uh, she has is when she looks at medieval interpretation, she says basically nothing happens from the end of the Church Fathers, so through the 6th century or so, up until the beginning of the Scholastic period, uh, so the, the 11th, 12th century. She says there's kind of this big pause in between. The problem is what Smalley was looking for is the kinds of things that we're used to thinking about as scripture interpretation. She's looking for commentaries, and this is not what they were writing. Instead, what the late patristic and early medieval thinkers did, for the most part, was reading strategies were woven into the fabric of the liturgies. Uh, and the, this was done in a variety of ways. First off, the basic fact of a lectionary, that we're appointing specific readings to be read at specific times, is itself an interpretive strategy. Uh, the antiphons and responsories. So these are, are pieces of, of the text put in relationship with other pieces. Uh, and through meditating on the relationship between those, uh, an interpretive act occurs. And then lastly, sermons and homilies were included within the liturgies. And th there are actually specific cycles so that certain sermons, uh, writings of the Church Fathers would be read at certain points uh, to respond to, to illuminate various texts. And so the liturgy gatherings of Christians, uh, either for the Eucharist or for the daily office, would be the way through which the Christian community as a whole learned these interpretive reading practices. So, key points. Most Christians before the Enlightenment could not read. The church's liturgies were their primary point of encounter with the biblical text. For those who could read, 
memorization, internalization, and then interpretation were at the heart of the process. The imitation of Christ and the virtues of Christ were the goal of the reading process. So St. Augustine will say that what the scriptures teach us is either the knowledge and love of God or the knowledge and love of neighbor. They either teach us how to uh, acquire and enact virtue or how to restrain vice. And finally, the liturgy was the primary vehicle for teaching scripture and its correct interpretation. 